Why do you want this job? Is a question I was asked many times during several job interviews over the years. And it's always one, isn't it, that there's a bit of a dance that goes on. Why do I really want this job? Well, it pays better than the other one. It's got a good pension scheme. I like the fact that I can work from home, maybe something like that. But what they really want to hear is, oh, I've really got a passion for banking. <laughs> oh, I, really, I just really love telecoms. And rightly so, they should answer it. I think the sort of onus really is on the people looking for something to do with their lives to really figure out what it is they want to do and why they want to do it. But on the other hand, there is a special kind of naivety, isn't there, about the, the interviewer themselves thinking that they're really going to find that nugget that is just really passionate about HSBC. Now, of course, jobs have to be marketed to us. We have to try and convince ourselves that we really want this thing. And as much as in the corporate world, a dichotomy very much still exists and a, uh, there's still a very much a sort of top-down governance and controlling element to it. And, and the, the employer is still very much the boss. They're the ones with the upper hand in every negotiation. Fine, don't want to work for us, we'll just get someone else. Not happy with five weeks holiday, fine, we'll go get someone else. They do adopt this kind of air of control and they don't like people that try and break out of the mold or try and stay true to themselves or try and do what's right for them. They just want you to conform. And so as part of getting us into this position, jobs have to be marketed to us. I mean, look at lists of you know, top 100 graduate employers. I used to look at that list and think, oh God, how much I would love to work for AstraZeneca. How great would that be? 36K a year, oh yeah, like that was just, back then like that was unheard of kind of money when you're a student right and so when you get the job finally there's this first this component of well I wanted it so bad it must be amazing because of how badly I wanted it so immediately the blinkers go up you don't want to see it for how it is you see it through rose tinted glasses because you've, you've you're invested, you've convinced yourself that this is the right thing, this is the good thing, this is going to get you that goodie, whatever that thing is. It's an arbitrary notion of lifestyle, of freedom. Not quite sure what that looks like, but hey, if they pay me 36 grand a year, it's got to be good. And then, of course, there's the social proof aspect the fact that everyone else wants that job as well, the fact that it's in the Times, it's in the top 25 best employers list. And the fact that everyone's congratulating you. Oh yeah, well done. This is what we do, isn't it? We go and we get jobs and you've just gone and got one for a really respectable company that pays okay. Well done you. Social proof is one of the most powerful forces that influences all of us, even the most free thinking independent, even the most intelligent. It's a really insidious, powerful force. None of us are immune to that. And of course, lastly, the scarcity. I'm sure they'll tell you at every step of the process, of which there'll probably be about seven, right? Again, building that investment and building this notion of scarcity, like, oh, step one, we cut out 90% of, app 90 of applications, cut out right straight away. You better convince us in the first five seconds that you're even worth talking to, otherwise we're not talking, we're not, we're not, we're not listening. So step one, they screen your CV, 90% out of the way. And then step two, right, might be a phone interview, might be an aptitude test. Every step of the way, in the back of your mind, thinking, am I going to make this step? Am I going to make this step? How many people are getting strewn down at this step? Then when, of course, when you get down to it in the interview or at the assessment day, whatever it is, whatever means they use, almost invariably, there will be some kind of comment from someone in the chain somewhere, senior, saying, oh, we looked at 700 applicants for this role, you know. Wow, talk about pressure talk about value, talk about that goodie. And of course, no wonder when you get this job, you're thinking, oh, wow, this has got to be great. I invested so much in this, everyone else wanted this, and I'm the one they wanted. I'm the one they chose. Wow, I feel good about it. I've got a good relationship with this job right now. It obviously loves me, so I'm going to love it back. Reciprocity. And then, of course, as time goes on, you start thinking, oh, well, I'm... Um, starting to feel a bit different, okay, uh, starting to feel 
maybe not as happy as I was when I was at university, if we stick with that example. Maybe not as happy as I was at the weekend when I didn't have to come to work. Certainly not as happy as I was when I went to Greece last year, when I went sailing around the islands. That was good, that was fun, that was a really good time that I had. Okay, well, but it's, you know, I'm making the money, it's, uh, obviously this is where I'm supposed to be because I invested so much in it, let's just stick with it. And then over time you start to feel a little bit unhealthy, you start to notice that the chinos feel a bit tighter, you start to feel a bit frumpy in your office chair, which is a bit restless, I want to move around a bit more. Oh, can I go to the, I'm going to go to the gym, oh, no, no, sorry, you've got to get here, we've got something urgent he's doing. All right, boss, sorry, yeah, no, I won't go to the gym, sorry, master. Can I book some holiday? Oh, lucky you. All right for some, isn't it? <laughs> How dare you go on holiday? How dare you do anything but shoehorn yourself into a, this corporate machine as a replaceable cop to do our bidding, to do what's right for us at the expense of being yourself and embracing your true self and doing your best work. We don't need you to do your best work, we need you to do this. Over time, it will start to erode, you'll start to fall out of love with it, if it's not the right thing. Now, of course, there's lots of jobs out there that are right for us, but if we find ourselves having to convince ourselves and our employer why we're passionate about investment banking, then chances are we're not going to fulfil our potential. We might stick with it, we might stick with it indefinitely, but are we really going to be truly fulfilled doing what we want to do, living our best selves, doing our best work and ultimately being of great service to other people, very unlikely. And so, having just sort of told a story there about how jobs market to us as much as we have to market ourselves to jobs, we don't necessarily realize that there's a, a an opposite here and that they are also marketing to us. They have to because it's not necessarily something we would do in our own rational mind. Instead, we are looking at other people what they are doing and we are going what essentially they're telling us to do because we don't have the clarity in our own heads of what a what's possible and b what we want and see how we as individuals can actually get it so what is the value on your time how much would they have to pay you in order to make that use of your time a substandard use of your time actually viable and in order to answer that question, you first actually have to know what it is you want to do with your time. And of course, that is at core the problem here. That is the only reason that people end up doing things that aren't right for them is because actually they don't know ultimately what they want to get out of it. And therefore they can't make a rational thought through decision about how to actually spend their time and how to target their behavior so that it produces the best result for them and, and others. Now, having thought about this, it, it can be very liberating say, to realize, to try something different, say to try going away for a very long period of time, thinking about this stuff, using tools that, that I might provide, for example, to actually figure out what it is you want. Maybe even go full-fledged digital nomad like I have, move somewhere like this, move somewhere like Malaysia, cut your costs in half, and then take the pressure off yourself a little bit. And then think, even if I had to just get by on very little, but I could still have that freedom, would that actually be any worse than working a full-time job, making great money, say you're making 500K a year, but you're spending 50 hours a week in the office. Is that really worth it? It's only worth it if you know what you then want to go and do with that money at the end. And final thoughts here, guys, there's a great misconception in that we presume that when we go and work at a certain cause as a means to an end, that it's like an on-off switch. We'll go, we'll do that thing for a year. Hypothetically, let, let's say we could earn 500 grand for two years. Go and do that, make a stack of money, and then go and just do whatever we want for the rest of our lives. Build non-profit businesses, do something philanthropic, and also just produce value-giving businesses that actually embrace our true selves and put us to our best use. Even if we were to do that, do you think that's gonna be a, a useful two years for you and your development? What's the full impact of that gonna be on you, your psyche, your behavior, your habits, your conditioning? These are not things to be underestimated. In fact, they are the most prominent thing you need to consider, is who you are becoming, not simply what you're doing. And so I'll leave you with that, guys. Hope that's useful. I shall chat to you next time.